Oh, well, good morning. Uh, my name's Mitch. I'm one of the pastors here. Please allow me to add my warm welcome to you if you're new or visiting. Uh, we're continuing in the book, sorry, in, in the book of Philippians in our series called Partners in Christ. Uh, we've covered much ground. This actually is our final our sermon in the book of Philippians on uh, being a partner in Christ. Uh, we've seen how Jesus transforms us from sinners into saints. And what that means is that we, we become partners in Christ. So we get to share in the blessings that come from that. You know, peace with God by faith in Jesus. You know, the resurrection power to live a new way. The joy of knowing Jesus and being united to his people now and forever. And as Jared mentioned earlier, uh, being a partner in Christ means that we're united to his mission. And now partakers in the mission of Christ, seeing the gospel advance far and wide, striving side by side together as we hold out the word of life, you know, suffering for the sake of Christ as we shine like stars in our dark world. And so today we're going to conclude uh, Paul's letter uh, in uh, Philippians uh, by seeing how we can remain content and generously give as uh, gospel partners, as partners in Christ. So let's hear from God's word in Philippians Chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. It says this. I rejoice greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves... I didn't touch it. Sorry. And you... Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, and no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I greet each saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Now let's ask God to help us understand his word and apply it to our lives. Let's pray. Oh, our good and gracious God, we thank you for preserving your word for us in our own language so that we can understand it. Now please use it to teach rebuke, correct, and train us so that we be equipped for every good work. Uh, grant us now open hearts and minds. Uh, keep us free from distractions so that we may engage with your word. Uh, may the spirit press it deep down into our hearts so that it will transform us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, speak, O oh Lord, for your people are listening. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Uh, who comes to mind when you think of someone who is content? Uh, do you think of a satisfied baby, you know, playing with their favourite toy? Uh, do you think of a retired couple at the beach enjoying uh, the beach on a nice sunny day? Or do you think of someone who is locked up in prison, like the Apostle Paul? You see, each of these people might seem like they're content, but only one of them is truly content. You know, for example, uh, the baby uh, might seem content at first, but if you take away their favourite toy, if you give them something that they don't want to eat or put them somewhere where they don't want to go, 
I bet you they will express their discontentment with deafening precision. It's a bit like the, the couple at the beach, isn't it? Well, it's a little bit different. You know, if you take away something that they enjoy, you know, if they happen to not be able to eat their favourite food because they'll get sick or if they lock their keys in their car and, and it starts to pour with rain, I bet they'll express their discontentment as well. And what about Paul? What if we did the same things to Paul? What will he do? Or if you take his books off him that he enjoys, if you give him food that's that he doesn't like, you know, prison food. If you lock him up unjustly, what does he do? Well, he remains content. No mumbling, no mumbling, no murmuring, content. You see, the problem is we live in a world that thrives on us being discontent. I mean, just think about advertising. Uh, the whole industry is built around making sure that we're content, that we're not content unless we buy what they're selling. So even if you're able to get away from advertising and the um, yeah that meet that um, advertising uh, in our culture, are uh, you will probably still struggle with contentment? Why? Uh, because we have eyes. Uh, we have that inbuilt desire to look over the fence and notice how the grass is always greener. You see, unfortunately, this will also affect the way that we use our money. How generous we are. Uh, because if we think that we need more of something to be content then when push comes to shove, we'll, we'll conserve, won't we? We'll try and keep what we have rather than being generous and giving our money away. And so we've got a real problem. We've got a real problem when it comes to contentment and generosity. And that's what Paul uh, uh, reveals here in our, in our Bible. Uh, you know, when it comes to contentment, we, it can feel like an uphill battle. And so we need the secret of contentment that Paul has. We need to be content like Paul. And it's something that's, that he's learned. You know, it's not a new philosophy or, or stoicism or anything. It can't be bought or earned. You can't download an app to be more content and generous. It actually takes a lot of hard work. It doesn't just happen naturally over time. It takes intentional work. Something that happens deep in our hearts. And Paul helps us understand what that looks like in our passage today. See, when we're left in the dark, when it comes to contentment or generosity, uh, God actually reveals how we can be content and how we can give generously as partners in Christ. Uh, so point one, if you have your, your outlines there, we're at point one here, we're to learn contentment in Christ. See, our contentment shouldn't be based on our circumstances or our situation, but on our relationship with Jesus. It should be centred on him. That's what Paul is saying all through Philippians. And it comes through God's empowerment. God empowers us to be content in this way. And we see that in the life of Paul in verses uh, 12, uh, sorry, 11 and 12 in our passage. So if you just look there with me, you'll see how Paul remains content regardless of his situation. I'll read it for us. It says, And not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and low down. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of having plenty and hunger, abundance and need. You see, this is remarkable because if you know anything about Paul and what he's gone through, it's remarkable that he's able to say, I am content. I mean, just look at where he's writing from. Uh, he's in prison. But you know, if you look at the book of 2 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul has actually gone through the highs and lows of life, the joys and the pains, and he's still able to remain content. You see, he knew how, uh, how good it was to be financially well off and, and how to have very little to live off. And in both situations, he's able to remain content. The same with his health. He's, he remembers when he's been healthy, and now he remembers when he's been sick and ill and his body has been failing him. And in both situations, he remains content. You know, a lot of you would have stories like this in your own lives too. Maybe you've, you've got great relationships and relationships are going well, or maybe you've been betrayed or hurt and they haven't gone well. And Paul knows this very well. He's seen ministry go well, planting churches, raising up leaders like Timothy and Titus, and he's been deserted, betrayed uh, by others around him. And in both situations, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content. And some of you might be thinking, oh yeah, I mean, it's the Apostle Paul, of course, that makes sense. But, you know, we're not Paul, so 
We don't need to be content like this. But that's the wrong way of thinking because God is saying here through Paul that we can actually be content because the secret is available to us even today in how to be content. And the secret is through our relationship with Jesus. Uh, We see that there in verse 10 where Paul says he's rejoicing in the Lord. And that's who he's referring to uh, all throughout this um, chapter here. You see, Paul is content with his deep relationship with Jesus, what it means to be a partner in Christ. Now, this is how Paul is able to remain content, not not like the Stoics, you know, unfazed and unmoved by what happens around them. And it's not this positive thinking, you know, always seeing the glass half full. No, it's not about Paul. It's about Christ. That's what keeps him content. You know, he, he looks to Christ who was rich, yet for our sake became poor so that we could be eternally rich. You know, that's who Paul is looking at to be content. It's only through faith in Jesus that we can have this type of contentment. In fact, Paul goes on to say that the secret is relationship with Christ, but it's something that comes through a bit of work, a bit of learning. He says that twice there in verses 11 and 12 that he learned this. He learned what it meant to be content with Christ, to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in, and in chapter 3, he's also said before that you know, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ is, makes him consider everything as rubbish, as loss. This is the type of attitude that Paul's been saying all throughout the letter. He's content with Christ. And so Paul is saying, in a nutshell, I'm not preoccupied with my circumstances. I'm preoccupied with Christ. And it's the same for us. We shouldn't be preoccupied with our situation that we're going through, uh, whether they're really good or whether they're not so great. We should be preoccupied with our good and glorious Saviour. There's no lasting contentment that we can have in this life apart from Christ. We, see, we saw that earlier this year in, our, um, in the sermon on John 6. You know, Jesus satisfies us completely. And this is the same thing that Paul is saying here. And, and, you know, remaining content in Christ actually frees us from two big pitfalls that we tend to face in life. Uh, the first one being that it frees us from denying, uh, despising God when we suffer. You know, when, when we lack money, when, when relationships are hard, when our health isn't great. You know, being content with Christ, we, you know, when we look to him, we see how far he went, how he humbled himself so that we could be brought near to God. And we see how Jesus was rejected and suffered for us, for our sin, so that we could be right with God forever. And this changes and shapes the way that we look at our life. It's, we're now focused on him and, and what he's done for us, not our circumstances. And this causes us to be grateful that we have Christ and that we're going to something better. You know, this life isn't all there is. And the second thing that contentment in Christ frees us from, denying God when things are really great. You know, uh, being, you know, self-sufficient, as it were. You know, it frees us from denying how God has, that even if we had all the things in the world, all the money, even if all our relationships were great and our health was perfect, that still wouldn't make us right with God. We'd still need Christ. And so we're grateful for that. We recognise our place under God. And this keeps us humble and grateful. And so that's, that's what it means to be content with Christ, to be satisfied with him and him alone, not to despising God when things are terrible and not denying God when things are going well, better than we deserve. And so, you know, we see that it's learned. It's God, just, God doesn't just zap us as soon as we become Christian and make us instantly content. It's not how it works. It didn't work like that for Paul, and it doesn't, like, it doesn't work like that for us either. And Paul has been explaining throughout this letter how we can learn contentment without actually saying those words. He said, even like in chapter 2, for example, uh, verse 12 and 13, he says we're to actively work out what God has worked in us. You know, this is the type of, of thing that Paul is saying here. But if we look, uh, if you have your Bibles open, if you look back at verses uh, four, to, 4 to 9, Paul actually gives us four ways that we can learn contentment. So if we begin at verse 4, we actually see that we're to rejoice in the Lord, which means to enjoy our relationship with Jesus. And then in verse 6, Paul encourages us to pray in any and every circumstance like when we're discontent. You know, and then in, in verse 8, Paul goes on to say that we're to uh, think about good and true 
and honourable things. You know, think about Christ and what he's done for us. Let that shape our minds. Then in verse 9, Paul says, put it into practice. All this stuff, put it into practice. When you feel discontent, keep looking to Christ and put into practice what you've seen others do, like Paul and, and others around us. You see, can you see how our contentment arises out of our relationship with Jesus? There is no other way. Uh, but there's one thing that we've missed, and I wonder if you caught it. It's in verse 13. The one thing that we missed is it all needs to be done with the power that God provides us. You know, it's not in our, of ourselves to be content. We need God by his spirit to empower us to remain content. And so Paul is saying that God graciously gives him the power to be content in any and every circumstance. Not rely on his own strength, his own willpower or determination, but on God. See, unfortunately, this verse in Philippians has been misquoted a lot and used out of context a lot. I'm not going to you know, name names or anything like that, but this verse does not mean that God will give us the power to do whatever we want or all our biggest hopes and dreams. This is not what this is about. Look at the context. It's all about contentment. You know, God empowers us to do the all things. The all things is all those circumstances, the highs of life and the lows of life, to remain content in Christ. They say, put simply, it means that God empowers us to remain content in Jesus, no matter our circumstances. That's the, that's the promise that we can grab hold of and cherish and treasure each day. Now, can you see how it's all a work of God's grace in our lives? Though? He empowers us to do this, but we still need to work and learn and grow in it as we rely on him. And so let me ask you a personal question. You know, how are you going at remaining content with Jesus alone? Now, don't think that just because I'm up here that I've got it all sorted and I'm content with Christ alone. Uh, no, this is an ongoing struggle. Continually need to repent and come back to Christ. That's my life. How are you going? How are you going when life is tough? Do you, do you look and depend on Jesus? And your life is going really well at depending on Christ and looking to Christ. You see, when life is going, you know, badly, we can always remember that Jesus is with us. He, he gets it. He understands suffering and pain, rejection, poverty. He gets it. And so he's right there with you. And he, and he, and he deals with that by going to the cross so that we can be right. God, and then he sends his Holy Spirit to empower us to be content with him alone so that we can be like Paul and say that we've learned to be content in any and every situation. You know, you might be coming up with hundreds of reasons why you just can't be content. You know, this isn't right, that isn't right, that's not good. But remember, if you're a partner in Christ, you have 10,000 reasons to be content in Christ. You know, we've been freed from the bondage and slavery of sin because of what Jesus has done. And, you know, Jesus satisfies our souls. We've been adopted into God's forever family. Our sins have been washed away. We're never alone. He sent the Holy Spirit with us so that we will get there to heaven in glory where there's no more sickness, pain or death, no more poverty and suffering. And we'll be there with endless joy and peace knowing Jesus. You know, that's what Paul means, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. You know, that's what he's saying here content with Christ alone because we will be with him forever, being more and more content. And so what practically can we do to grow and learn contentment? Well, like we've seen before, and it's on your outlines there, those, those points, those four things, we can be rejoicing in the Lord, we can be praying, we can be thinking about Jesus and putting it all into practice. We need to be asking ourselves regularly, you know, am I content with Christ alone or am I looking for a certain figure in my bank account? or a particular job I'd like to have, or a particular house I'd like to own? Or am I satisfied with Christ alone, come what may? Now, does this mean that we never seek to change our circumstances if they're terrible or hard? No, but we don't look to that to make us content. We're content with Christ. It's all about him. You need to be asking yourself, you know, maybe chat over lunch or, or morning tea, 
What situations has God put in my life to help me learn contentment? That'd be a good question to ask. Now, one resource I've found particularly helpful in thinking about contentment is um, the book called Rare Christian Contentment uh, by Jeremiah Burroughs, Puritan. Uh, it's heavy, but it's good for the soul. Really pushes you. Think about being content with Christ. All right. So now that we've seen how we can be content with Christ alone, uh, Paul now shifts gears and he focuses on giving generously as partners in Christ. <laughs> and so point two on your outlines, uh, as partners in Christ, we're to give generously for Christ. Now, being a partner in Christ uh, means that we generously use what God has given us to advance his kingdom and see the gospel go out far and wide. Now, we're to invest in the work of the gospel uh, so that others can spiritually grow and God will get the glory. You know, we saw in uh, verse 10 that Paul is thrilled that the have renewed or revived concern for him, that they're now mindful of him. What that means is that they've now resumed their ongoing support of him financially. Uh, they've been prevented for a time, but now they've resumed. And we see that there in verse uh, 15. I'll just read it quickly. It says, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. You see, the point is the Philippians have now uh, resumed their ongoing financial support of Paul. Paul, the gospel worker, who's, who's working hard to see the gospel go to the nations. And it, Paul commends them of this in verse 14. He says it's kind of them to have shared in his trouble. Uh, the, the translation uh, that we use here at the ESV, the word for share really means partnership. It's the same word that Paul has been saying over and over again in Philippians. So literally, Paul is saying, you know, it was kind of you to partner in my trouble. So it's a weird way of saying it, but that's what Paul is getting at. And the way that they're doing that is contributing financially to Paul's work, to, to the work of the gospel going out. That's how we share in the trouble. You know, being a partner in Christ, it's not about like being a consumer or just coming and sitting and soaking. No, it's about contributing to the work of the gospel. It's about contributing to the mission that Jesus began and continues today. We've got to get some skin in the game. That's what Paul is saying here. And we do that by giving generously uh, to the work of the gospel, near and far, so that many would have the opportunity to know and love Jesus. And we do that even when it's inconvenient. And the Philippians knew that. You know, that's what, you know, that, remember back in chapter 2 how Epaphroditus almost died getting this gift to Paul? You see, they know the, the sacrifice it takes to to do this, to be generous and give to the work of the gospel. And, and, and if you read um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 8, you'll know that the Philippian church isn't flush with money, that they're giving generously out of their poverty because they've been motivated by Christ. You see, this is one of the signs of being a true Christian, of being a partner in Christ. You, you want to give to the work of Christ and see his name known and loved among the nations. You care about the mission of Jesus so much so that you're willing to sacrifice for it, seeing many people know and love Jesus. It's the willingness to share with gospel workers to, to make sure that they have the opportunity to share the gospel with others. That's what it means to be a partner in Christ. You know, this is it's kind of like the story of, uh, the true story of Zacchaeus and that rich young man. You know, compare the pair. It's not an ad, but, but compare the pair. Zacchaeus, when he had a real interaction with Jesus, ended up being so generous because of the grace that Jesus had shown him. And in contrast, this rich young man, when he was lovingly encouraged by Jesus to be generous, didn't. And he walked away sad. You see, that's what, that's what it's like here. You know, What's happening with Zacchaeus and this rich young man is, What's going on in their hearts if they've really been transformed by Jesus or not? And so it's the same for us. Our willingness to be generous is an indicator of what's going on deep in our hearts, whether we 
fully understand and appreciate the gospel. It indicates um, our generous generosity or not. <coughs> you know, that, this is how God works through his church. He uses his people to support his work to accomplish his will. And so just in case you thought Paul was was just saying all this to get more money, just in case you think I'm up here just going, you know, pull out the wallets, he stops that right in its tracks by saying not once but twice he is not in need. This is not about getting more money. He says it in verse 11 and he says it in verse 17. He's been well supplied. God has met all his needs through the, the, the generous giving of the Philippian church. So he's not asking for another hand, but he is pointing them to something much deeper that's going on in verses 17 and 18. And that is that it's bearing fruit that increases to their credit. It's a difficult way, uh, it's a difficult phrase actually, this verse. Fruit that increases to their credit is twofold. It's the spiritual fruit that comes about in the life of the Philippian church. They grow to be more like their generous Lord and Saviour. So that's one thing. So Paul's already mentioned fruit back in chapter one, you know, the fruit that increases to your righteousness or something. And so Paul is saying that that, that fruit of looking more like Jesus comes out when you give generously. But the other dimension that Paul uh, says about fruit is, this is a fruit that increases to your account. And it's not their earthly bank account, it's their heavenly account. So that when they reach heaven, they will be able to look at how God has used them to bring more and more, and more people into heaven and to build them up in Christ. And so this is the fruit that Paul says uh, increases to their account. And so can you see how it's, it's not about Paul? It's not about the money, it's about God and what he does and how he uses us, his people, to, to accomplish his will. And I wonder if you notice that strange language in verse 18, the strange language uh, Paul uses to refer to their financial gift as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable to God and pleasing to God. You know, this is straight out of the Old Testament language of, of, of worship in the temple. And we've already seen this before in chapter 2. Paul describes the service and history of the Philippians in this type of way, as a spiritual offering, as a sacrifice. And so what Paul is saying here is that one of the ways that we worship God is through our generous giving. As we serve one another. And this pleases God. And if Paul wants them to know that giving generously is more about God than it is about them or it is about him. It's the same language in Romans 12. You know, this is our spiritual worship to God by living his way. And one of the ways is by being generous. So we're to worship God with our money, not worship our money. And then in verses 19 and 20, we get these, this remarkable promise that God will supply all their needs, all our needs, according to the riches in glory in Christ. And this is yet another verse. So I've got a two verses that are quoted out of context all the time and used poorly. This isn't meaning that God will give you all that you want or desire in this life. Uh, you've got to look at the context again. What's the context? Generous giving to God's work. So God supplies us so that we can be generous to others. That's the connection that we've got to see here in verses 19 and 20. And it's all ultimately for God's glory, not to you know, everything that I want, the perfect house, the perfect car, the perfect family. No, 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 no. It's not about that. It's about God graciously giving what we need spiritually and physically so we can be generous to others. That's what Paul is saying here in verses 19 and 20. So maybe you're thinking, well, what, does verse 19 mean that we don't get all our wants and desires? Well, no, we don't get everything. Look at the life of Paul. Look at the life of Jesus. They were given what they needed to obey and be generous. They were given the Holy Spirit, as, as we have, to be generous and encourage us in generosity. You see, God supplies what we need to be generous to give to others. That's what Paul is saying here. Our motivation for generosity needs to be Godward, not manipulation, not guilt-tripping, 
not sending money in the mail to get a blessing back. No, 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 no. That's demonic. That's not what Paul is saying here. God is generous to us, so we're generous to others. That's what we need to get here. And we need to, we need to do it to bring God glory, you know, because of who he is and what he has done for us. That's the, the prime motivation. We're to see how much he has graciously given. Jesus came from heaven to earth to save and redeem wayward people, people who didn't want anything to do with God so that we could be right with him by faith. You know, he's given us everything. You know, we can't outgive God. He's given us this world, the air in our lungs, the food in our bellies, the ability to earn a living. It's all from him. And so we're to be like him in our generosity and our giving towards his work. We want his name known among the nations. That's what we're on about as, as partners in Christ. And one of the spiritual blessings is that we, we get to be more like Jesus in, as we do this. Therefore, I think we shouldn't wait for a certain uh, amount in our bank or a certain job that we want or a certain house that we want before we start to give generously. You know, we might have all these things going in our minds. You know, it's really hard to give. You know, money is tight. Living expenses are high. You know, I get that. We need to keep going back to verse 19. What does verse 19 say? You know, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He supplies so that we can give generously. That should be our motivation. So let me ask you another personal question. How much of your money or all your time is dedicated to this? to advance the work of the gospel. Now, can, can Paul say that what you're doing is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God? And perhaps you're sitting and thinking, you know, I can't afford to give, you know, any more. You know, maybe you have real concerns about money or, 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 or other things. Well, if that's you, what, what can you do? What can I do? Well, we need to cling to verse 19, the promise that God will supply what we need to be generous. We need to keep relying on him to motivate us to be generous for his glory. We need to remember the God that we serve owns the cattle of a thousand hills and the riches of heaven as well. You know, we need to remember that what we have cannot be bought with money in this world. We have eternal life through Christ by faith. So we don't need to worry about the, our money as much. We do need to worry about you know, who we are in Christ and, and our, lift our eyes to our good and gracious God who promises us so much and is powerful to deliver. Now, one practical thing you could do if money is actually tight, instead of giving financially to gospel work, why don't you contribute by uh, your time or your gifts that God has given you to the work instead? That'd be something to do. You know, that's still generously contributing to the work of the gospel. You know, like Epaphroditus in our passage, who, who risked his life to get the gift to Paul. Well, you could be like that. You know, actually, there's another good resource on this sort of thing. Uh, it's called The Generosity uh, Project. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a short book uh, that you could do um, in, with your family, or in your growth group or Bible study, or maybe you could do it when you catch up one-to-one. -one. It really helps us think through how we can be generous like our good and generous God. And well, let's be creative in how we give generously to God, motivated by his generosity to us. And so what have we seen today? We've seen how we can be content with Christ, no matter what life throws at us, and how we can be generous because of God's generosity to us. And so Paul concludes his, his joyful letter by circling back to where he began by referring to these Philippians as saints in Christ, as holy ones. You know, we see that in verses 20, uh, sorry, 21 and 22. And that's, that's what matters most, being a saint in Christ, being a partner in Christ. There's no point in trying to be content without Christ. There's no point in being generous to get Christ. That's not how it works. Be in Christ and let that motivate you to be content and generous. You know, lift your eyes to our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus, and let that shape our contentment and generosity. Imagine what would happen if, 
If we made a decision today to be content with Jesus alone, no matter the highs and lows of life. Imagine what would happen if we made a decision to be generous, like our Lord Jesus is. You know, what would happen in our families, in our workplaces, in our, in our homes, even in church, if we acted like this, if we really were content with Christ and we were trying to strive to be generous like him? Well, let's ask God to empower us to do this, to be generous and content partners in Christ. Let's pray. A gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we've been both challenged and encouraged uh, from your word today. We've been challenged to be generous like Christ, like you are to us, lavishing physical and spiritual blessings upon us. And we've been encouraged to remain content with Christ in the good times and in the bad times. Uh, please uh, grant us the joy of remaining content in Christ when life is going well and when it's not. Help us to fix our eyes on him and not on our circumstances or situations. Uh, grant us wisdom uh, in how to use what you have generously given us for the work of the gospel. And may we do it all for your glory. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.